John Legend, welcome to Q. Thank you. It's great to be here. Nice to see you. How's it going? Oh, I'm, I'm feeling good. Uh, it's snowing outside now in Toronto. So uh, it's perfect, perfect time for a Christmas concert. And you're a bit of a Christmas baby, right? You're around, your birthday's around Christmas. Yeah, December 28th. That hard for growing it's up? It's terrible. It's the worst time to have a birthday. Do you get that party or? Uh, you don't get a party. You uh, <laughs> barely get a gift because everyone's like already got you one for Christmas. Um, so yeah, it's pretty much, I can't imagine a much worse time to have a birthday. I know someone who has their birthday, so the birthday's on December 25th, like it's on Yeah, Christmas my cousin, day. I have a cousin that uh, is on, tw- on the 25th. Oh, it's rough. And so she, like, since she was a baby, has celebrated her birthday in the middle of June. Yeah. And she just gave, she gave herself another birthday. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm turning 40 this year, so it's a kind of a big uh, birthday for me, and I'm going to do it in January. How are the, how are the birthdays with the kids now? I got two. They're fun. Uh, you know, we have we had Sesame Street characters come to the last one. Mm-hmm. It's you know, it's it's kids parties. How about Christmas? Christmas is fun, but you know, the issue with my kids, I think, is they get so many free gifts all the time. So we try not to overload them with gifts during the times when they're you know technically supposed to get gifts right. because they're always getting free stuff all the time. So we're just trying not to spoil them too much. <laughs> I, I got a friend of mine who uh, he. I don't know. I mean, it's it's an interesting thing, but like he he doesn't give any gifts to his children before they're three years old. Oh, because he says to me, they're not going to remember it anyway. That is true. They won't. <laughs> you, you're really doing it just as an exercise for yourself. I think. I um, think my daughter will remember her next birthday for sure. She'll be three in April. Luna, right? Mm-hmm. I'll tell you what's cool, and maybe we'll cut this out afterwards, but Luna and Miles, mm-hmm. there are two children on our staff. Like a produ- uh, the daughter, oh, cool. one, of, one of our producers is Luna, and the son of one of our producers is Miles. That's great. Great names. Yeah, it worked out really well. I, I love them. Um, I couldn't help but notice this is, this is like a secular Christmas album. There's no O Holy Night. There's no O Little Town of yes. Bethlehem. Yes, I recorded O Holy Night, and I recorded O Come All You Faithful, and they just didn't make the cut, honestly. Um I, you know, I have to pick the best material for the record, and just it just didn't measure up to the other tracks. I thought it's, so. It's not about reaching out to a more secular audience, trying to include everybody. Um, it it was not explicitly no. I mean, I'm I'm fairly secular, but I grew up in a very uh, religious home, and uh, so I was comfortable doing religious songs for the album. Um, but it just the songs just didn't. Uh, they didn't sound as great as the other songs. You grew up in a really religious home? Very religious. What yeah. kind of, uh, how involved uh, were you guys in the church? Yeah, my grandfather was the pastor. My uncle took over for him when he retired. My mother was the choir director. My dad was a minister as well and played the drums. Two of his brothers are ministers and, you know, lots of ministers and and uh, <laughs> how did you, how musicians. Do you, how do you avoid it? What do you mean avoid it? I didn't. <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think about the same thing, that all my, all my family are teachers, and I don't, uh-huh. I don't know how I managed to not become a teacher. Well, you know, I grew up in the church. I, I, I'm not religious now, but, um, I, you know, I grew up surrounded by it. And uh, it was it was an important part of my upbringing and an uh, important part of me becoming a musician. Well, that's what I wanted to talk about. Like, uh, what, what do you think you can learn from playing in churches? Not necessarily playing sacred music. And I'm, I'm not talking about, like, the belief in God or anything like that. Mm-hmm. But, like, playing music within the church that you can't really get anywhere else. Well, one thing is just playing music, period, and playing it in front of people at a very young age. When you start pretty young, you develop your skills as a musician. It's like... Where else in your life um, as a 10-year-old are you going to get a chance to play and sing in front of people? There's yeah. not as many opportunities as you would like. And, uh, and uh, so the church, particularly for uh, black people in America, has always been a, um, a very important training ground for some of our best musicians. Mm-hmm. And they're beautiful. It's beautiful music, too. Yeah, you know? it's wonderful music. And, and uh, you know, it... it it helps you uh, understand how to move a crowd. It helps you uh, learn to play by ear because a lot of the church services that I played were improv. Uh, there was some element of you know planning, but there's a lot of improv. Mm-hmm. And so you learn those skills and flex those muscles early on as a musician. And so it makes you a better musician. And if you go down the line of all the band musicians, uh, all the, all the um, singers... Um, there's a lot of them that grew up singing and playing in the church. So you you go into high school then, you uh, and then you go to the University of Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. and it seems like 
the experience of being so musical at such a young age really came in handy. So t- tell me, if you, just listen to this and see if you recognize uh-huh. it. It's me. What is that, John Legend? Tell us, tell us what that is. That's me singing in an a cappella group called Counterparts. Um, Counterparts is at the University of Pennsylvania, which is where I attended. And uh, I was, uh, during my time there, I was the music director and president of the group. And uh, I, uh, that was one of my big solos, One of Us. Uh, we did a version that was loosely based on... Um, Prince's uh, cover of the song, but obviously it was made famous by Joan Osborne. Mm-hmm. It's uh, a cappella singing is a great way to hone your musical chops too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I did a lot of the arranging for the group, and uh, that was a that was a muscle that I hadn't exactly worked on a lot. Even though I arranged for choirs and like kind of simple, you know, three part harmony before, but um, doing it for a cappella is a whole different beast. And uh, so I learned a lot in that. And this was theory time. too. This was this was not- notating, arranging yeah. kind of music. Yeah, I wrote it out, did the whole thing. Where, where did you learn that? Where did you learn your like? Well, I learned uh, I learned to read music and to uh, you know understand notation when I was pretty young. I started when I was four uh, with piano lessons, playing classical music, playing um, studies, classical, and um, we did a little bit of that. And then I learned how to play by ear and, and play gospel for my grandmother. So. It was kind of those two things that were happening at the same time. So uh, during that time at UPenn, you play piano, and I didn't know this, on one of the most important songs of, of our time. One of the most important albums, certainly, uh, Miss Education of Lauryn Hill. Take a listen. He could have shut it down there. Like you could have, you could have never played music again. <laughs> <laughs> if only it paid as well as, as, as you think. You could have just, you being know, a, being a session player on a record is not very lucrative. So, you know, it was not retirement money. If you're just tuning in, I'm speaking with John Legend, who played piano on uh, "Everything Is Everything" by Lauryn Hill. How old were you when you did that? I was um, 19. Yeah, 19. How does that happen when you're 19? I knew people. I, I knew... Um, Do you remember getting the call? or? Well, I, I was um, playing at a church in Scranton, Pennsylvania while I was going to Penn. And I would drive up there every weekend and play at the church. And one of the singers that I met there, she had grown up partly in North Jersey near Lauren Hill, and they had gone to school together. And she was like a mentor to Lauren and a friend of Lauren's. And she was going back and forth as Lauren was working on her solo record. And, um, you know, everyone was talking about the Fugees after the score had come out in Mm -hmm. 96. And um, everyone was anticipating Lauren, you know, knowing that she had the chance to go solo. And um, my friend Tara, she invited me to go with her to the studio. And uh, I was in the room hanging out and didn't expect too much from it, but just to kind of be on the scene and, meet some other musicians and uh, at some point Tara said Johnny won't you play a song for her and I played a couple songs for her what'd you, what'd you play I played her an original song called too late and I played uh loves in need a song by Stevie Wonder yeah so I played both of those songs and um she was digging it and she was like why don't you play on this record we're working on right now and it was everything is everything did you know at the moment it was going to be that big well, I knew it was highly anticipated, for sure. Yeah. And um, you never know how great it's going to be. You never know whether the quality of the content itself is going to be great and then how it's going to be received. But it had uh, all the above great quality and was received uh, with acclaim and lots of record sales as well. Plus, you're able to go to bars then and, you know, when it comes out on the radio or comes on in the club and be able to go, hey, actually, that's a... Uh, that's me. That's me playing there right yes. there. Yes. <laughs> but I can only imagine your it, friends must have freaked it out. It was my it. claim to fame on my, in my senior year at school. So my senior year comes right after that. The album came out in August, and so I got to uh, have bragging rights for the entire school year. But you didn't get a record. You didn't get a record deal. You didn't play immediately right out of college. You got a job. I saw as a management consultant. For yeah. A while. So I was trying to get a record deal even back then. So at, when that happened, I started to generate some interest in 
you just circles around Penn and people that knew other producers and writers. Well, there's writers. a real scene, right? We had um... well, Philly. Philly certainly has a scene. So, Philly at that time was a special time because the whole neo soul movement was really blossoming, and you had the Roots there, and you had uh, Music Soul Child and Jill Scott and Bilal and Jaguar Wright, um, and then you also had other musicians who weren't from Philly that would come to Philly to work with those people. Right. So like Erica Badu would come there, Common would come there, D'Angelo. Um, all of these folks that... <laughs> they weren't big at this time. They weren't... Well, the Roots were, you know, they had been around for a while. They weren't huge, but they were like well-regarded in, yeah. in the music scene. And then um, Music and Bilal and Jill Scott weren't big yet when I first encountered them. But by the time... I would see like D'Angelo or Common at these open mics. They were already pretty well known. Erica Badu, um, they were all pretty well known. Uh, but they were working with you know folks from Philly, so it was a great time to be in Philadelphia. Right. So so then you you get this gig. Is I don't even know what a management consultant is. Yeah, it's hard to explain. But essentially, the the firm their job is to kind of help companies mostly big companies, yeah. uh, figure out uh, their strategy for one thing or another. So maybe it's a new product launch, or maybe it's uh, a merger with another company. Or But this is just an office job, right? It's this an office is... job. It's you you know, meet with clients, you interview customers and clients, you draw up PowerPoint presentations, you do modeling, uh, you do research, uh, you know, competitive research, all those kinds of things. It's a very sexy, very sexy work. Yeah, I can tell. I'm, I'm, I'm jealous right now. I'm thinking about giving this up and going yes. to do it myself. Maybe yes. I'll get a nice cubicle. <laughs> Wouldn't be so bad. Yeah. But, but tell me this, John. Like, how do you... How do I put this? How do you... When you have all this ability, you've already played on Lauren Hill's record. Mm -hmm. You obviously know you're a, a talented musician mm -hmm. and you're a peer of folks, like you said, Erica Badu, you're like at least in the same rooms of these people with the Roots playing music with them, right? Well, I was at the same clubs with them. I, I, they didn't know me yet. But you, but you were good. Mm -hmm. How do you keep going when it's not happening? Um, because I believed in myself. I believed that I, I was going to do it, and it was just a matter of time. Did you know what it was? Like when you say I, I knew I was going to I wanted to it. be a solo artist. I wanted to write and sing my own music. Um, I wanted to be where I am now. Sitting on Canadian public yes, radio. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the dream has been realized today. But you know what I mean? Like, dude, dude, those, those, those dark nights. I mean, I have friends who are musicians right now who, yeah. you know, they have a little bit of success. It's starting to go away. They're, you know, they're struggling. Yes, and I felt that as well. I felt, you know, some frustration because I would go into meetings with record labels and they would turn me down. Every label, every major label turned me down at some point, even the one I'm signed to now. So, yeah, I understand what the rejection feels like. But also, I really did believe that it was going to happen. Yeah. I believed it the whole time. And that's, that's, there's optimism there. That's, that's, yeah. that's the, your, by nature, nature, an optimistic person. Yeah, I am by nature. And, um, and also, I would have enough milestones along the way that felt like, okay, yeah. Things are happening. Right. So uh, eventually you meet this like upcoming producer who recognizes your talent. Yes. His name is Kanye West. Let's take a listen. Let's do it. At the end of it, you know we both were wrong. But I love to play the blame game. I love you more. Let's play the blame game for sure. Let's call our names. Names. I hate you. Oh, let's call our names, names for sure. Did you, what, what drew you to him as a producer? What drew me to him? Um, well, I'll tell you how the introduction happened first. My uh, roommate um, that I went to Penn with, his name is Devon Harris, and he's a uh, producer, he's an entrepreneur. And um, at the time, he was making beats himself and and getting involved in the music business and his cousin moved to town his cousin was kanye west his cousin uh was an up-and-coming producer and was just starting to work with rockefeller records and jay-z and beanie siegel and dame dash and all those guys and um i heard some of the records he did with them and 
it sounded like he was onto something. Like he had a cool sound and was really talented. What did you hear? Um, I heard some of the stuff he did for Jay Z, but also just some beats. Um, what did you like? Like, what did you hear? It sounded soulful, but it was like a really interesting blend of soul and hip hop. And I thought the two of us together could do something really interesting. It had like an old school sensibility, but it felt fresh at the same time. And it sounded like what I wanted my music to, to be. So where did the meeting happen? First time we met was at Jimmy's Uptown in New York, uh, Harlem. It's a uh, club. And I was playing a live show there back in 2001. And uh, Devon invited Kanye to the show, and we met there. And then you started working together. He saw something in you. Yeah, and then we started working together. He had an apartment in New in Newark, New Jersey. Um, and I used to go over there and just work on songs with him. You know, you've been asked a lot in the past couple of months to talk for Kanye. And people, I've seen, I've seen people in the press ask you questions like, you know, what is Kanye thinking? Or yeah, you know, I, I'm not necessarily as interested in that, John. Yeah, it's not. It's not a very. It's not a very fruitful conversation because I, obviously the best way to find out what he's thinking is to have him tell you. <laughs> so here's here's what I want to know, and I think it's it's mm -hmm. it's it's fruitful for our time more mm -hmm. than ever. How do you work with someone who you may disagree with politically? Well, I, I think. Well, first of all, um, we haven't really worked together since all of this stuff has happened. Okay. Uh, so it's something to think about. Yeah, can you maybe then? Is the um, I think it's possible, but I don't know. I think you have to have some kind of connection with an artist for you to create together. You have to kind of at least connect on some kind of level, on a, like a spiritual level, on a values level. You have to connect with them one way or another. And that doesn't mean you have to agree on everything, but you at least have to have some kind of connection. So, you know, I haven't tested that out yet uh, in in working with him since all of this stuff has happened. But, you know, everything's fluid. <laughs> As you've seen on Twitter, he's kind of gone back on some of the things he said before. So. Yeah, saying he's saying he's been manipulated or saying that he's been... You yeah, know, like, I have no idea how to assess that. But uh, I, I think we do disagree on certain things, and, and, uh, and we'll see what that will lead to in the future when it comes to creativity and collaboration yeah i mean i get it it's it's it's, it's harder and harder you have you have kanye west uh you know sitting down and meeting with president trump you know and we're constantly wondering about the separation of an artist politics and whether we can enjoy their music i mean we just had a panel last just last week right about 808s and just how great how, how great 808s was when it first came yeah, out I'm 10 years old no. um how often I, I think it's i think you're unfairly represented sometimes in the press as being or you were unfairly represented in the press as being apolitical. Because when you, when you scratch the surface just the tiniest little bit, like when you use the either end of a dime, it's not hard to see all of your activism, activism throughout well, your yeah, life. Well, yeah, and it's been my entire career, and even before my career. Um, I think the people who were surprised that I was somewhat political was uh, were people that just didn't know who I was. <laughs> or they just knew me from all of me. Um, Right, because you, you campaigned with Barack Obama and Hillary yeah. Clinton. You, you did. You, you covered social justice music of the of, of, of our time. I you, even you before I was famous, I marched against the Iraq War. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is not new for me. Political activism is not new. I think people just liked me for my music and perhaps didn't know. And uh, some of them of the conservative persuasion were not pleasantly surprised by this fact what do you mean <laughs> well some people say I'll, I'll never listen to this guy again you know how does that make you feel it's fine I, i'll be okay i'll be fine um i i realize it costs me a little bit but I, I think it's worth it because for me as an artist the best way for me to be an artist is for me to be truthful and to be myself and that's part of who i am Oh, yeah, I, I understand that, you know, because I, I think there is a certain shut up and sing mentality going on right now. Yeah, you know? but only if you only if you say things they disagree with, of course. They they were, like, excited about Kanye being Team MAGA as long as he was Team MAGA. But as soon as he, if he were to come out and reject all that stuff, then all of a sudden he'd be shut up and sing again. And um, <laughs> I know what you mean. I know what yeah. you mean. Yeah, right. And so I think people, when they disagree with you, they'd rather you just shut up and sing. But um, 
I'm just not going to. So everybody can make a choice about what they want to listen to and if that matters to them. And like I said, I'll be okay either way. You grew up where in uh, in factory town, right? Yeah, I grew up in a pretty small city. Um, and the biggest employer was my dad's um, day job. He was a factory worker. Um, a place called Navistar, they made uh, trucks. Mm-hmm. Big, like, huge 18-wheeler. You know, here in Canada, we just lost a plant out in Oshawa, Ontario. Yeah. A GM plant went down. Yes. I mean, everyone's getting laid off next year. Yes. 2,500 unionized jobs. Yes, I know exactly how that feels, and... and my entire area in Ohio has been really devastated by plant closing after plant closing after plant closing. How does that factor into your politics? It makes me more pro-labor. It makes me um, just aware of the difficulties facing a lot of people in, in towns that rely on these type of jobs to survive. I think that sometimes... When I see, I'm not sure how to put this, John, but sometimes I think that I see some folks kind of say, well, you know, those towns are pro-Trump, you know, or whatever. Those, 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 yeah. those industries are gone, but I feel like you have, you have perspective on, I mean, these are people's lives. You can't throw people away, you know. And I, I was annoyed watching the news yesterday because when people talked about GM closing, they talked about it, whether it was a loss or a win for Trump. Right. And it, that, that's the least of my worries. Right. Um, because I know what it's like to be in a family that depends on that income to eat, to have health care, you know, to survive. Are you able to be optimistic in general? Yeah. I mean, politically? Yeah, I'm optimistic. Um, I know we said by nature, but it's not easy. I think by nature. It's not, it's not simple. Uh, and I'm still like frustrated and annoyed and angry sometimes when I read the news or watch the news. But... I am optimistic. And I also think even during these times, we can have small victories that really mean small kind of in the scheme of things victories, but that mean a lot to a lot of people. You know, some would say just having children at all feels like an investment in the future, right? Yeah, I mean, you'll, yeah, (laughs) you're hopefully creating a new generation of people that are going to do something interesting in life. Hopefully they'll be leaders. Hopefully they'll do something great. And um, hopefully they'll inherit a world that we haven't completely screwed up. I mean, that's the hope, right? I mean, mm-hmm. because, because you, I have, I have uh, friends of mine who say, you know, I'm not, I'm not having children. I'm not bringing children into a world like this. Yeah. yeah it, it, it's a dark thing to talk about, but you know, it, dark, is, it is. You know. It's a dark thing to talk about, and I think it's something that you consider, but then... I think there's just this natural urge to want to see, as a couple, to see yourselves recreated <laughs> <laughs> to, to in see, the world. <laughs> to see a version of yourself. Yeah, and have, have someone to love and to raise and to mm-hmm. teach and to, you know. I think it's a natural biological urge for a lot of people. It's a, I, I, I definitely understand the biological urge mm-hmm. part of it, but I, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still hunting here for... Just something, because when I meet someone, so I, I, I interviewed Michael Buble the other day, mm-hmm. you know, and I, and I said to him, I said, like, he's, he's, I don't know if you know him that well at all. I don't know him well. But I, uh, we have some musicians in common we've worked with, but. Great singer. Yeah. Canadian, by the way. Of course. Uh, and relentlessly positive, especially since, the, you know, his, his, his child was diagnosed with cancer, he's mm-hmm. in remission now, thank God. But, um. He said, I'm, I'm just trying to focus on positivity. I'm just trying to focus on positivity. And yeah. from what I can tell from talking to you, you're trying to focus on optimism. You're trying to focus on, focus on but positivity. But honestly, I don't even try. I just, I just am optimistic. <laughs> what, do you, what do you do when you wake up and you, you, you wake up and you look at your phone, I guess, like we all do, and you have those dark days when the world seems rough? Well, I think my family makes me excited to wake up. My job makes me excited to wake up. I get to make music for a living and perform for people and bring love and joy to people's lives. Um, yeah, so I feel blessed. I, I, it's not some effort I put in to be optimistic, though. I just... I, I get it. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm, 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 it's entirely possible I'm, I'm overthinking this. I'm just, <laughs> maybe I'm just hunting for but, some sort but of... But I, I, I mean, I read an article the other day about what it means to be grateful and to be like actively grateful even if you're not feeling that way at the moment yeah. and how that can actually create positive effects. 
So maybe that's a thing that people should do if they want to kind of sustain their happiness and their optimism is think of reasons to be grateful. And I, I have a lot of them. Yeah. One of which, and then this has nothing to do with your family, nothing to do with the world that we're in right now, but you, you, you won that EGOD. I did. <laughs> that's something else. That was pretty cool. So I just, was buzzing on that for a little while. So I, I want to be clear to people, that's a... I almost want to get you to say it, but I'm not going to do it to you if you don't want to do I it. I can do it. Go ahead. It's an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a Tony. And I had the G, O, and T parts until this year, and uh, I finally got the uh, Emmy. So are you, sitting in the, are you sitting in the theater just going, man, if I get this E? Well, I mean, it had been talked about a lot by that point because once I got the nomination, I mean, it was a clear story and an angle for reporters and everyone so i had talked about it a bit and so i was you know anticipating it and hoping that it would happen you're only young man you could probably double you got and just to clarify i wasn't the absolute youngest person there was uh the guy that wrote frozen lopez is his last name I think robert is his first look it up sure we, we, we can cut that out he was a little bit younger than me Oh, he was a little bit. So you're not the youngest person. I'm not the youngest. I'm the first black man, though. Robert Lopez, I just found out, doubled he got. Did he? Did he really? I don't. I don't know about that. The first, the first black man to Egon. I am the first black man, and he's the youngest person. That's quite a club to be in. Yeah, it's only 15 of us total. So how meaningful is that to you, honest to God? Though, like, uh, it was meaningful. I mean, I mean, it is meaningful. It's something that is rare and special, and uh, each of those awards individually mean a lot to me because of the stories that go with them. The people I worked with, uh, the the blood, sweat, and tears that goes into creating art. And, um, you know, it makes me grateful and proud. But how? Like, but it has to be a recognition of, uh, you, you mentioned the recognition of the people you work with, of the stories you got to work on. But it has to be separate than the actual work itself. Like, do you see this as a recognition of your work, or are you just doing your work? I mean, it's all that, because a lot of the work we do, like, is its own reward. Um, putting it out to people and having people enjoy it is its own reward. And, and having people say it's great is, is, is rewarding as well. And then for your peers to say it in an academy that's kind of organized around, you know, recognizing achievement in our art forms for our peers to say it is really cool too it really is like it feels nice does it feel different when you sit down at the piano now no but uh that's kind of what i'm asking right no like it, your work it, is your work the work is the work um but it it, it just it, it kind of especially for the first few weeks it just felt i just felt like a little glow around everything <laughs> just kind of excuse me a kind of a little buzz um you know, it just kind of gave me that a little art, uh, you know, a little natural buzz. <laughs> so, so let's go back to that person who's a management consultant, mm -hmm. played on everything is everything, but you weren't entirely sure whether it was all going to work out. But you, you were hopeful. Mm -hmm. But you, you, you had some darker moments. So let's. You just won this egot. What, what would you say to that younger John Legend? <laughs> It's going to work out. <laughs> it's going to work out. I mean, but, I, but I, I believed it was going to work out back then. That's the truth. There's a lesson here, I think. <laughs> There's a lesson here. There's a, that manifestation thing they talk about. I guess, I guess. And, but you have to put in the work. And, but I think when you have optimism kind of fueling your work, it makes you feel like it's going to pay off if you keep working. Do you still practice? Yeah, well, I don't know that I practice, practice. I learn songs, and then I rehearse with the band. Do you learn songs you're not going to perform? No, I don't just practice for fun. It's usually directed practice, like I'm prepping to perform a new song or right. prepping an arrangement for one reason or another. So that, that last question was just for me. Okay. I'm always, I'm always very curious about people practicing. Yeah. I have to work so much that work is practice. <laughs> John, nice to meet you. My pleasure. Thank you for coming in. Thank you.